This podcast is brought to you by A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family-owned and operated, by the Diocese of Huron, a community where families and individuals from Windsor to Owen Sound, Grand Bend to Port Rowan, come together to worship and serve, and by Molly Maid. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. Sumaya Matan is a writer, part-time social worker slash psychotherapist, and strategic advisor for the Ontario government, working on a wide range of public policy files, including anti-racism. Her book, The Shaitan Bride, is a true coming-of-age story of a girl navigating desire and faith. Through her journey into adulthood, she battles herself and her circumstances to differentiate between destiny and free will. Samaya Matan's life in love and violence is a testament to one woman's strength as she faces the complicated fallout of her decisions. We talk about her book and so much more on The Vicar's Crossing. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you may be listening. We welcome you back to another edition of the Vickers Crossing podcast, a virtual space Yay! where faith intersects with the public square and where Kevin and Ian and I have intersected with you today. And we're happy about that. Thanks good to see Ian again. Good to see you. Yeah, again, good Robin. to see yeah. you back on the screen, yeah. handsome young, young guy. Uh, I'm Rob <laughs> Henderson from uh, Holy Trinity St. Stephen's in London. And I'm Kevin George from St. Aidan's Church, Northwest London. And, that's and I'm Ian. Guy. And he... as as they've as they've told the very handsome one uh, <laughs> at the bottom of the screen here, uh, who edits his podcast and sends it out into the world. Hope he's one it. of the. Remember my cousin Vinny. He's one of those yeah. Utes. He's one of those he's Utes. A Ute. That's he's great. a Ute. These two and, Utes. And unlike Kevin and I, who have a face for radio. Yeah. Um, Ian's doing much better. Ian's than us. What a handsome lad. Well, I recently got new glasses, so I'm sure that's well, all. Yeah, well, that's you look it. Good. Yeah, that's I it. I, I <laughs> personally find myself man crushing when you look crazy. <laughs> secretly want to be you, Ian. I'm like, if I could just be Ian, I'd be a happy guy. <laughs> Uh, season eight, or excuse me, uh, yeah, yeah season eight, season fourth eight. episode yeah. of season eight uh, yeah. of the Vickers Crossing. And today we have a new guest, excited to welcome to the podcast, uh, Sumaya Matan. And Sumaya is a writer and part-time social worker and psychotherapist, as well as a strategic advisor of the Ontario government, who has worked on a wide range of public policy files, including anti-racism. And as an author and writer, she has a book which is titled The Satan Bride, a Bangladeshi Canadian memoir of desire and faith, which was released in 2021. And it's a coming of age story of a girl navigating desire and faith and her life in love and violence, quite a testament to one woman's strength as she faces the complicated fallout of her decisions and a wonderful story. And we're going to get into that with with uh, Samaya coming up in just a few it's minutes. A, it's such a great book. And the one thing I want to note about this, you know, before we get to it as well, is just the the nature of which, and she starts the book with this disclaimer that says this is not a rescue story because it's mm. a story of her. She, she went to visit family as a 19-year-old in Bangladesh, and she's more or less held hostage and being forced into a marriage, not an arranged marriage, a forced marriage. Mm. And she want, she was hesitant to write this book because of implicit biases that we all bring to the reading. Sure. of anything and our thoughts about arranged marriage here in the West, et cetera, et cetera. And she really invites us to park that at the door and hear her story as something right. fresh, which right. it really is because her faith is something she, that means so much to her. And she didn't want this to in any way feed into, you know, sort of uh, negative stereotypes and implicit mm -hmm. biases and Islamophobia. But anyway, more on that later. We'll we did that, want, yeah. we want to get into all that, but we want to acknowledge that the, uh, um, the place from which we originate this podcast are the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenape, and Attawandaran peoples, and are connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796. And these lands continue to be home to diverse Indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and as vital contributors of our society and people with whom we wish to walk the path towards reconciliation. And we also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors here on the Vickers Crossing podcast, uh, great supporters of 
of what we're doing here. First to A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family-owned and operated. And our thanks to Dave Mullen, and a big shout-out to everybody at A. Miller George today. Thanks so much for being a part of it. Yep, and a great thanks to the Diocese of Huron. Uh, Todd Towns and Bishop down there, they've been very good to us. Uh, it's a community of families and individuals from Windsor to Owen Sound, from Grand Bend to Port Rowan, and all points in between. People are coming together on Sunday, Sunday singing, All Creatures of Our God and King. <laughs> <laughs> and last but certainly not least, you just want to say a big thank you to Molly Maid. Make your home a healthy haven call Molly Maid London today. They'll come in and clean your floors, all that good stuff. Clean, yeah. All right. Good Heck stuff. Yeah. Well, Samaya's here. She's been yep. waiting as we've been uh, yakking on. Yep. So we're going to bring her in from Toronto, just down the road, and talk to her and get into the book and much, much more on the Vickers Crossing podcast. All right. And Samaya joining us now in the Vickers Crossing podcast. Samaya, we're so happy to have you aboard with us. So happy to be able to chat a bit more with you and about your book and so much more. How are things in uh, in Toronto today? I'm sure you're getting maybe a little bit of the snow we're getting. Very snowy. I just got back from Bangladesh, actually. So okay. where where I bet it's not snowing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so totally different yeah. from really hot mosquito weather to snow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you made it back safe and sound. Yeah, we never know anymore getting back into the yeah. into the with all the weather we've been having. So glad you're aboard. So happy you can join us, Samaya. Um, and uh, I can only imagine the how's the jet lag? Are you are you getting over that? Yes, I mean, last couple of nights I did not get any sleep at all. <laughs> oh, Random yeah. hours, um, yeah. but getting better. Yeah. How how far ahead is Bangladesh? I think, how many hours? I think it's about eight hours, but don't mm. quote. Yeah, Oof, wow. ahead. that's mm -hmm. not good. Look, uh, congratulations on the book. Uh, a couple of years old now, I guess. Uh, but I really love reading it. I actually read it in two sittings. I just could not put this memoir down. Your story is so compelling, and you're you're such a strong woman. What you've been through and how you've carried that, and particularly how you've carried it and still honored uh, your faith and uh, and what that means to you and how you've kept that together. Um, this book really pulls the reader and uh, pulls the reader in and demands that those of us who are reading it, uh, he or she, really pay attention to the complexities uh, of relationships, of culture, of, of faith, and of how all of these, for better or for worse, impact who we are and the impact who we are becoming. Um, I've heard you express in other interviews talking about your memoir that you had some hesitancy about telling this story um, and largely tied to, to really not wanting to feed Islamophobia or negative stereotypes that people have of, of Islam. Um, in fact, in the very first page of your book, uh, it's uh, two lines <laughs> and it's a disclaimer. And it says this, disclaimer, <laughs> This is not a rescue story. Talk to us about the importance of that disclaimer. I mean, for those of you who are hearing about this book for the first time, you'll come to know more throughout this interview, but it really is a story of of uh, of Samaya having to make her way back home to Canada uh, from her original home in Bangladesh. But talk to us about the importance of that disclaimer that this is not a rescue story and the internal complexities that you had to come to grips with in order to write such an honest and vulnerable retelling of your journey with God to this point in your life. For sure. Uh, before I start, I don't think we mentioned the title of the book. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, but we did before we brought you on. Oh, yeah. okay. 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 I'll just right here. Tell us all. It's the Shaitan Bride, yeah? Yes. Shaitan yeah. Bride. Yes, yes, the Shaitan Bride. Yes. Um, yeah. and, and also, I just wanted to say thank you for having me. And it's an honor to be here to have this discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. So I really appreciate it. Oh, but yes, yeah, awesome. to, to go on uh, answering your question. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll start with just saying that, you know, when I started writing this memoir, I was quite aware that in the Canadian literary landscape, there aren't that many racialized Muslim writers um, mm. that get published. And so we have, we still have, the publishing industry still has a lot of work to do when it comes to representation of mm. 
voices. And so I think the effect that that has is that the few authors that do get published, there's this incredible uh, onus that gets placed on them or that they take on where their voice sort of becomes this representation of their entire community or their community's experiences and histories. And so I was quite aware of that onus. Mm -hmm felt it very strongly. Um, and I also knew that, you know, the types of stories that do get published, I noticed that there were patterns in terms of how those stories were framed. Um, you know, I had done a, a little bit of a scan on different memoirs that dealt with topics of forced marriage that involved Muslim women or journal articles that talked about similar topics. And I found that there was a bit of a trend when it came to the way that the 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 headlines and you know the the content was framed it usually was something along the lines of um you know escaping an oppressive culture or religion or family and that those titles did they and th that framing didn't sit well with me and i felt that they were quite colonial in nature in that i felt that um they echoed sort of this long history that we've had all over the world throughout time where you know um certain narrative narratives became the dominant narrative and uh, that reinforced particular ideas about inferiority and superiority. And so I was quite mindful of that going into writing this memoir. And in addition to that, I was working on it during COVID. And mm. so if we I'll go back and think about how it was like during yeah. the COVID mm. that time, you know, there was so much fear uh, there was so much anti-Asian hate, but also we really got to see some of the, the stratification of, of society according to like the privileges that people had and like yep. access to And there was so much of that. Um, and I thought a lot about sort of the vulnerabilities that certain communities experienced uh, in that context, you know, especially like thinking about Muslim women who yep. were in situations of domestic violence or potential domestic violence who, didn't have access to their usual coping mechanisms, for example. And so thinking a lot about that, I would say fear and anxiety like was at I the bet. forefront of my mind. And I like bet. How the book would be received, but also personally as well, thinking a lot about my family. Um, and then going back to just in general, um, you know, thinking about like during high stress times, how oftentimes we revert to like rhetoric that reinforces like yeah. uh, in fear and so just really mindful of that um so it wasn't fun like thinking about yeah, all yeah. and uh and uh i think what really struck me though um after kind of being in paralysis for like a couple of weeks and facing a lot of writer's block and thinking about these things was that this like this this thought that crossed my mind um, and it and I can't I won't quote like the particular hadith because um, mm -hmm. I don't know like I can't remember what yeah, yeah, fair enough where it's from exactly but it's something along the lines of you know express the truth even if the truth is bitter yeah. or or if you're gonna say a word at least say the truth something along yeah. the lines of that yeah. and and I and I kind of sat with that for a bit and I thought that you know, um, the most the, the most important thing I could do is just write a story that is as honest as possible. Mm. Um, of course, personal truth is subjective and that everybody has their own truth. Um, but, um, you know, I was in a position to to like express that truth, my truth, and uh, I, I had a right to do that. And so just really kind of grounding myself and giving my per myself permission to do that. Um, and also thinking a lot about the benefits of writing a story like that, where other members of the community could potentially feel seen, um, whereas as, as a lot of these topics aren't necessarily um, you know, uh, discussed publicly, or uh, even like within families as well. So, so I kind of just gave myself permission to do to do that, um, despite the the fear. Um, and I think just to add to that, in terms of my story and writing my truth, I really boiled it down to the crux of the story, which was essentially an internal 
uh, conflict that I experienced mm -hmm. that led to my relationship with God. Um, because if I think about it deeply, you know, it's it's very much about like wanting love from God and wanting to be loved by God, to mm. love not and and sort of worrying about losing that connection um, and whether that love in this book you know is communicated also through by you know talking about my family as an extension or the romantic interest or or the culture or whatnot like it's it's all an extension of this very core uh drive which was to feel connected and to feel love and not and not wanting that to be uh taken away um and so I think once I sort of focused in on that a little bit, that allowed me to just like write whatever came to me. Um, and um, of course, I think at some points in the writing, like there was fear that came up and I just acknowledged that fear. And you might've noticed in the memoir, yeah. I kind of talk about the fear. And I think that's all I could do was really just name it in the process as it came up. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. You can read in the book that you you articulate well the complexities in sense in the sense of being able to talk about your own faith and how that even supported you in your most traumatic moments and and you know beyond. Help our listeners now understand the title of the book. Who is the shaitan uh, in Islam? And elaborate on the concept of the shaitan bride and how you use it really as a bit of a literary device throughout this memoir. Yeah, for sure. So the shaitan is, I would say, equivalent to Satan in Christianity or popular mm -hmm. culture. Uh, and the reason that shaitan is a part of the story, such a central part of the story, it, it kind of goes back to these stories that I heard as a young girl that I mentioned in the memoir, where, you know, women who deviated from what was expected of them or were troublemakers or you know did did something other than what they were told they were often referred to as you know having done shaitani or uh, being devilish or like the language that was often used to talk about women or young girls uh, in, in these contexts seemed to always revolve around shaitan and so mm. it I kind of sat with that like from an early age and, and wondered about that. And uh, as I grew older, there was just a lot more thoughts that I had around the relationship between morality, like being good and bad uh, and sexuality and gender. And mm -hmm. it just seemed that there was a lot of, it was quite loaded when it came to that, when it came to women and faith faith, religion, gender, sexuality, especially as it pertained to women. And so, uh, and, and I found that like in other stories of, um, you know, jinns who are like basically creatures made of smokeless fire that could be ill-intentioned Ill or like positive, just, you know, as sort of tools of, of shaitan to uh, get humans to do like ill, um, I found that stories of jinn that involved men, they're often quite like transformative. Like it's, it is sounded as if, you know, they had gone through some sort of spiritual um, experience and so, and gotten closer to God. So perfect example of that is, you know, this, the story of Layla and Majnu. Uh, and mm. I think the story comes from like Arabic, um, Indian, like that part of the world. And, it, you know, it, it's there, it, there's many different uh, explanations or versions of it. But one of the versions is that, you know, there's this like man who falls in love with this woman. Um, so Majnu falls in love with Layla, but then, you know, cannot seem to find Layla after like she kind of goes missing and then he spends like so long trying to find her i think the context is that um her her family doesn't approve of her being with him and then she's forced to get married to someone else or something like that in what of in one of the uh iterations and so he goes on just like yearning for her love for for so many years and um eventually comes to realize that this void that he has is actually 
him seeking a deeper connection with the divine. Uh, and she's sort of a catalyst. Um, in whether it be in the form of a jinn or an actual person, it's sort of a portal or a gate, gateway for him to connect. Um, however, I, I have never read any stories about women who had gone through it, these kinds of transformations. The, the stories that I heard about women and jinn, ill-intentioned jinns or shaitan, usually just resulted in them, you know, sort of being overtaken, being powerless, um, being weak, and having to, to kind of like protect themselves from mm. from the done being them being more vulnerable and so that was really interesting and um through the story as a literary device i wanted to you know kind of subvert that narrative um and you know being called a shaitan or being called immoral um for like for young women who you know find themselves in situations like I did uh, when I was young? Like it can be quite, uh, it can have a lot of mental health impacts yeah, for the. It's got to be, got to be crushing. Yeah. The bride, I mean, in, in 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 our parlance, it's the bride of Satan. Exactly, yeah. exactly, and like it, you know, it's it could be used as a form of spiritual abuse. Like I'll just throw in that word because mm -hmm. it's kind of like using concepts that yeah. uh, you know, and and so. So what I wanted to do was like really tell a story about words that had been used uh, on me, directed toward me, or that I had heard, um, and kind of subvert that narrative. Um, the other part of this is that if we go like, if we look back at Shaitan's history, Shaitan was actually originally Iblis. So Iblis was, was like um, basically uh, in the memoir I describe Iblis as being really like misunderstood. So this is a Sufi interpretation of Iblis. Yeah. So Iblis before Iblis became Shaitan, uh, refused to bow down to Adam because um, the, the the story is that Iblis felt that, you know, at, Adam uh, could not be equated with God and therefore uh, Iblis did not want to bow down to anything other than God. And so in that Sufi philosophy is described as the ultimate monotheist and like the most devoted to God. Uh, mm -hmm. But but in that situation, Iblis is cast out um, and, you know, out of paradise. And then Iblis then becomes shaitan and then has this goal and mission to uh, lure humans into in, into into doing ill. And so uh, we're listening to like the parts of themselves that draw them mm. doing ill. And so um, this misunderstanding of Iblis, like the original that 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 beginning story um i kind of wanted i bring a beliefs up in my book because you know it this i describe in the book how a lot of my adolescence was misunderstood and mm -hmm. and so and i think that misunderstanding also applies to just like understanding religion in general and just like forced marriage as a topic or just like experiences mm -hmm. with so just like overall, it was such a common common theme. And so I, I thought Iblis was such a great character to kind of frame the story around because it's, you know, you have this tragic romantic hero that yeah. is driven to, you know, serve and love and um, but then is like shockingly sort of uh, misunderstood. And there's so many consequences that Iblis experiences. And then the turning point is where at least like the 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 pain and the uh, you know it it kind of solidifies um inside and he becomes shaitan and so mm. it's like this play on you know our what happens when we experience these kinds of shocking events as well and and how do we um reconcile uh you know like traumatic experiences or experiences where you know there's things don't make sense anymore in terms right. of light and darkness. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I think back to that time when I was in Bangladesh for five months and seeing my family members whom I loved so much, um, kind of being the, like, basically, um, you know, not listen to what I right. had to honor yeah. that. Uh, and it, it was shocking and yeah. it, it didn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense like how there was there was a loss of innocence there, I think, as well, in terms of how I viewed the world or understand the world. And 
the complexities of human beings, which, yeah. uh, which I, which I didn't know about at that time. Oh, so, well, you were young. You were nineteen. Yeah. Uh, I, and I mean, I think you know, Rob's got a question here. Before he does, just that I think the thing that comes out of that for me is in terms of how you use the shaitan as a literary device is you really do a good job of, um, you know, like the complexity of, if we just use the terms good and evil, uh, you know, Alexander Stoltiskin said that the line between good and evil runs through the heart of every man. Um, that it's not as simple as being able to identify the darkness or bad things or whatever as something that's out there, that, that, that it's, it's within us at times. And so the way you talk about it, it's almost seductive or haunting or, um, you know, this sort of, and, and it's, it, you know, I'm never afraid I, reading the memoir. I was never afraid when you wrote about Shaitan. it wasn't like a fear of, it was like this sort of familiarity. And so your willingness to enter into that, I think was really, really profound and helpful as a reader of, of the text itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we want to get into a little bit of your, of your story too. And it's an incredible story. And, um, want to talk about, we'll start with, you know, coming to Canada and some of the, some of the stories around that, um, immigrating with your family when you were just six years old and you end up landing in Thunder Bay, uh, and it's cold. <laughs> it's always cold. <laughs> yeah. What yeah. a, what a contrast, right. From where you came from and, and culture and everything else. And you describe in the book, the difficulties that you felt, uh, at such a young age and, you know, fitting in is not going to be easy cultural differences and racism, just the newness of, of all of that. And you're right about your father, um, an engineer by training, expressing his frustration with trying to find employment, right? And you write that um, your dad was especially fond of reminiscing after long days of job hunting that seemed to uh, kind of impose his mood upon the house, the gravitas, even the speed at which shadows moved across the room, as you write so so beautifully here when he returned to the dinner table he'd share his distaste with the interviewing process that he was going through and he would say i have experience and i'm fluent in english they just keep asking for canadian experience what does that really mean <laughs> um and then as the years passed the disappointment in his eyes melted into a steadfast river of responsibility mm. and it was there in this this new home this new beginning that you described first getting a sense of a visit from the Shaitan Bride. Can you say more about maybe those first uh, months in Thunder Bay before you actually moved to Toronto and, and give us more of a context of that for you? Yeah, for sure. So I remember that time period through fragments of memories. Mm. I was so young, so yeah, yeah. not quite clear. So even when I was writing, it was just a series of vignettes that sort of popped up in my mind that I, I you know, used to and put together the narrative. Uh, but I, from what I do remember, you know, it, it was such an exciting time, but it was also a time of newness and change and, you know, the, some stress and tension, a mix of so many, so many emotions. Um, and one of the, the most important changes that like vivid changes, memories that I can remember is like just the space, the difference in space, like Taka had such a population density issue mm, yeah and thunder bay holy smokes yeah yeah like just walking down the street and you're always in, in taka you're always like there's the the personal space you have is very little mm, and yeah. you wake up to the sights uh, like the sounds and sights yeah. that are like constantly ongoing the rickshaw bells the um man outside selling vegetables or yeah. what like it, it, it becomes such a normal part of your experience. And so in Thunder Bay, it was completely quiet. Um, the spaces between houses were, were large. Yeah. And Must huge. have felt huge. Yeah. yeah. It, and that was exciting for me because I, yeah. it was almost like, you know, this, like this, the space to, to uh -huh. explore. Um, and I felt like a very unique connection with nature and it might be quite cliche to talk about Canadian wilderness and I know loons it loons <laughs> yeah like uh but it's it's literally I felt very connected to it and and I think um that part of that experience really resonated with me um at the same time you know there was differences in my experience when it came to people you know like uh for the first time when I turned on the television I was seeing people that looked completely different um oh and uh, I remember scenes like in my head of like 
our, my immediate family and my relatives sitting in the basement watching Hollywood movies and there would be these scenes like sex scenes and we'd all like cover our eyes <laughs> like <laughs> laugh which is something that never happened in Bangladesh like we wouldn't okay. really do that like on, on interesting TV. how very interesting yeah. right yeah. Yeah, like it, like little things like that were different. Um, and then in school, you know, just just being um, very quiet and just observing people speak English. Um, I, I went to an English medium school in Dhaka, but in Thunder Bay, you know, I felt particularly like, um, I don't know what it was, like I can't quite remember, um, but I just felt like it was different and I just needed time to absorb my mm -hmm. surroundings. And I, I describe in my book at some point, yeah. you know, I I just can't, I just start talking and then I don't yeah. stop. <laughs> so all of that was like very, very new. Um, I, I did want to note that, you know, one of the experiences, and I think this is very common in, when you migrate, is like the sense of being embedded in a social fabric. That is mm. something I, at the time, I might not have wor had words to articulate, but looking back, and even now to this day, I, I feel that this is a, a very big, like it's something to grieve. Um, yeah. and in Bangladesh and Dhaka, you know, when you walk down the street, everybody knows whose daughter you are, who's yeah. you, know, they, you are, or they know your, your grandfather, your grandfather's father. There's like this lineage, there's this like family mm -hmm. history and you feel mm -hmm. it in, a, in a fabric. Whereas like, of course, when you migrate to a new place, you're sort of creating that for yourself from yeah. scratch. Um, yeah. so that's one like really uh, big loss, even up till today that I, I often feel, it almost feels like I'm sort of floating, floating around sometimes here, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, kind of not planting my feet completely into the soil. Um, and there's actually, there's some theories that talk about that. Um, there's this one theory that, and I can't quite remember who the psychologist is, but there's uh, this concept of, the home country or motherland being a mother and the 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 migrant sort of being like weaned out of mm. that that experience of um you know that infancy and being close to the motherland being sort of thrown out into the world and there's always this uh longing or yearning for the 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 warmth of a motherland or a place and of course that place is constantly changing it doesn't stay the same but it's almost like there's this like sense or this memory um that you kind of take with you it doesn't matter where it is you're you're traveling to and so i would describe that meaning um to be like i would say that resonates with me um just go living and going to different places but then carrying sort of uh, pieces of all those places with me, but particularly the place where I spent my infancy and uh, my young years. Um, right. So, so I think that sense was always there. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I wanted to also mention, and this is really interesting, and it's with respect to the the Shaitan bride. And you know, I I used it that uh, that uh, mention of the Shaitan bride in that particular chapter at the end because it sort of foreshadows what's right. to come. The chapters mm -hmm. after and mm -hmm. it also signifies to me how um you know the the i don't want to say baggage is not the right word but almost mm -hmm. like the 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 uh, the experience of like gender and gendered expectations like it traverses geographical boundaries right. like even if though i was in can i was now in canada some of you know, what uh, the stories that I had heard in Bangladesh about these women, they would be carried with me to this place. But not only that, I would also experience those kinds of stories, but in a different form in mm. this. Story. So there was that. But I, the other um, element that I would say that signified for me was just the, the idea of like supernatural and spiritual ex experiences. I think sometimes when we think about the East or countries yeah. in the West, you know, they, there's this sort of like, you, you, it's really interesting. Even when I go back to Bangladesh now, you know, having conversations about jinns or, um, you know, like faith, like those kinds yeah. of 
things are much easier to have in those contexts. Okay. And it's almost like when you come to the West, it's there, it becomes compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. It's like there isn't much room for that. But I think that that's a part of human experience. Yeah. Um, and so for me, having the shaitan bride appear in that chapter signifies that there's still that part of me that exists and that mm -hmm. type of experience still exists, even though we are now in this like Western land where that's not yeah. part of me, the common, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so then to continue on your journey, you don't stay in Thunder Bay because you end up in Toronto. Because she's got and better sense. I don't that's know why right. That's there. right. So, that's, Thunder Bay, send your letters to Rob Henderson. <laughs> yeah, Rob no, Henderson. <laughs> <laughs> Love Thunder Bay. <laughs> um, but anyway, you end up in Toronto in a neighborhood nicknamed the Jungle. It's an area of uh, Lawrence Heights in North York. And you describe it as a cluster of, you know, low rise public housing apartments. And you talk about living in the interior units of these apartment complexes as kind of being in, in the belly of the beast. And you go on to describe it as a biome of as people from all over the world living together in twined ways. And uh, its name, you know, is racist and was a place that was misunderstood by outsiders. Uh, and a few years after moving there, your dad has a horrible thing happen. He has a brain bleed, and it was a near-death experience for him. And you write about him coming out of that and and then taking his duty as uh, a father to protect his children all the more seriously. And you talk about how he was more, you know, conscious of your online life, um, you know, th what you were wearing and who you're hanging out with, et cetera even going so far as to ask you to be mindful of the news around you. And these were the days around 9-11. And what you later realized was your father was wanting to for you to think critically about your Muslim identity and what that meant in this place that you were now living. And you say you felt this as restriction, but that just years later, you would see the ways in which the survival um, you know, of uh, Muslim men and their families have had such a devastating effect. Can you say more about that that surveillance period or that surveillance placed uh, on you by your father, that pressure in your family and ultimately on you as you kind of, you know, felt your own freedom to be wanting to be like other adolescents that was hindered a bit? Um, what was that? What was that experience for you? Yeah, for sure. What's really interesting, I find, and this is in retrospect, is that a lot of what was happening throughout the trajectory of time mm. was mirroring my coming of age. Um, so, you know, when I was in the early years coming from Dhaka to Thunder Bay, like entering into Canada, like what we were just talking about, you know, it, that time period was very much about um, just, just like that sense of, of, newness but also displacement and uh kind of trying to understand like supernatural spiritual um kind of where 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 the the boundaries are with that like entering into this canadian like western space like but like developmentally it's like at that age in terms of how you're processing things you know you're you're kind of like the this what's the word like thinking about um fantasy and mm -hmm. you know um magic magic like it's almost like the way i've written it and i've realized this after it's like it mirrors the developmental uh, experience of of a young girl um and so this period in jungle was preteen puberty teenage years and this is as you mentioned the time where 9-11 was, yeah. was happening and yeah. the rhetoric around Muslim men as being dangerous and yeah. women as being oppressed and the backwardness of Muslim communities, that was very, very much heightened. And not just like in terms of, you know, the, the, the rhetoric, but also like actual policy yeah. and practices that was happening at a very systemic level, you know, like racial profiling, airport stops, like interrogation. Mm. Yeah you know, surveilling like online activity. There was like so much that was happening systemically, but also, um, you know, just in a day-to-day -day experience of, of a Muslim person walking the streets, especially if you were visibly Muslim. Mm -hmm. And then a, 
um, you know, the gendered Islamophobia as well, uh, where, you know, if you're wearing hijab or other, like other um, forms of identification that you belong to the community. And so that was the climate. And um, I feel like at that time, because of, of the, the climate, there was this sort of um, the conversation about faith became very much uh, black and white. It became very much it's very dichotomous. Like it was East versus West, um, you know, modern versus backward. Uh, it was like you're with us or you're not, or like where, which which camp are you on? And so I, that dichotomy, it was quite difficult for me to um, kind of process that at the age that I was in. Um, and if you think about the adolescent brain, at that mm. time, you know, we're that's the time where you're developmentally and biologically, you're sort of developing complex thoughts. Like the world is no longer simplified with black and white. You're kind of um, processing things emotionally, um, intellectually, like you're sort of the complexity increases. And so I think um, the rhetoric wasn't sitting well with me because it didn't make sense to me. Um, and um, when, when, you know, I think it's very natural though, when you do hear this kind of rhetoric and you have these experiences for fear and anxiety to be heightened, uh, there's like a certain visibility that you feel uh, in public spaces. Yeah. And, a lot of Muslim communities felt that way, like just walking, like just thinking about some of the hate crimes that occurred, walking down the streets, if you're visibly Muslim, the violence, um, the impact of the violence experienced by someone who'd say been attacked, at, you know, it, like those we experienced collectively, even if it didn't yeah. happen to us individu as individual Muslims, seeing that in the media or hearing about it has devastating impacts. And yeah. so kind of in this fear state and shaken to the core. And, um, you know, it, at, at that point, in terms of my relationship with my 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 dad, you know, um, it, like, I, I just want to say that, like, he's a very intellectual person and in that, um, like, when he has discussions, he's very much about, like, thinking through things. Um, and, uh, like, it's not your stereotypical sort of, you know, Muslim man laying down the rules, but rather he encourages a lot of reflection and discussion, and has mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of em empathy. So mm -hmm. I think it's just at that point, because of the heightened um, sort of, you're, you're on this camp or that camp, as an adolescent, registering any discussion about faith felt very much like, you know, a, a choice that I had to make. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, about who I wanted to be. And um, when you're in a state of fear and anxiety, I think like with my dad, he, he very much encouraged us to go back and think about our roots and, you know, reflect on what it meant to be Muslim. And, you know, he aspired for us to vis vis like uh, present ourselves yeah. in a cool way, connect more to our roots. And and I think it's a natural response too. Like when, when you feel like you're not, being seen or understood in the broader community, you want to feel empowered in some kind of way. Um, and so that would be the source of the empowerment. But it clashed very much with where the where I was um, in my developmental needs and the context that I was in. Because as a teenager, you know, you like your main priority is to somehow fit in with <laughs> people that you're around or to establish your own unique identity but in order to do that you kind of have to put yourself into different social groups uh, you need to explore yourself um, yeah. and so, so it was like a very like very much like a clash uh, in terms of you know the 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 needs I had as a teenager as an adolescent growing developing wanting to explore myself wanting to you know um like connect with my peers, be more like my peers, uh, but at the same time being uh, like strangely visible, but in a very negative way because of what I was seeing in the media. And yeah. then in terms of trying to find empowerment in my faith or my culture, not, not feeling connected at the time to the way that was being asked of me from 
my dad or from like my family environment because to me that felt quite like it didn't quite um I didn't as I say in the book you know because I was in a I didn't have that much representation around me in terms of like you know other Muslim like I didn't even have hardly had Muslim friends there was only like two South Asians in my school so it was a like tricky time Um, and so this is I think it's really important to think about diversity in in all contexts because it really does make such a difference in terms of how much a person feels like they belong um, and can express all the different parts of themselves and can have such a positive impact on mental health Uh, because I I know during those years as I say, say, say in my memoir like I had lots of mental health struggles at that time so yeah, so I would say it was just it's it was a very unique um sort of interaction between all of these forces mm-hmm. at that time. Um and uh like it I I uh I also describe in the memoir that it's not just like this vigilance from the um you know Commun- other communities who are not Muslim, sort of looking at Muslim communities, but also within Muslim communities as well. Oh, for sure, yeah. So like Muslims looking at other Muslims, like how mm-hmm. Muslims are you? Like mm-hmm. are you sending, you know, yeah. like what are you doing or not doing? Like, and so yeah. that itself also was quite constraining for me um, because of course I, w- I needed to find the religion and faith in my in my own way. I needed to make sense of it and express it in my own way. I needed to like learn about it through exposure to different ways of talking about it and met different mentors. And so it, like all of those kinds of needs, um, they were very much constrained because of the, the pressures of that time societally uh, trickling down and at the community level. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the way when I read it was sort of like trickle down surveillance. That's what I called it because it's this idea of like, you know, your father feels that pressure, your mother feels that pressure. And I couldn't help but think of the Afsal family here in London, uh, who were walking down the street here like three kilometers from where I sit right now, uh, when three generations of that family were wiped out and left young uh Fayez to be uh, on his own. Um and they were targeted because they wore traditional clothing from back home in India. They were a Muslim family. Um, and, you know, you realize that, and, you know, the march that ensued out of that was a lot of folks in this city saying, you know, we're learning for for some of us for the first time just what it's like to be living under that sort of surveillance and criticism and um, the need for us to hear more diverse voices at all levels. Uh, so, I mean, I really was was taken by so much of what you wrote there. You also write about falling in love uh, with Bav. Am I saying that right, Bav? Yeah, Bav. Bav. And and is Bav, is Bob Bob's name? Or no. Is like, I no, okay. Yeah, I wondered. I was like, I wonder if she's writing about Bob and Bob is like, <laughs> Bob is sitting back reading this going, oh my gosh. <laughs> So, so Bob gets an anonymous name, right? Yeah, all okay. of that. Okay, okay, good. So, Bob was Sikh, is Sikh, so remains Sikh probably, but in the book, I mean, you know, I was reading about him. Uh, you write about forbidden moments and not being able to talk about them, and feeling that it wasn't something that you were able to to discuss. And again, you get that nuance of the shaitan, you know, like in, in the midst of this, you write about being many people in one body is the way you describe it, which I thought was really quite fascinating. You describe the discomfiture that ate away at your peace. Uh, in your love with Bob, you would move from pleasure to shame. And you write about that by saying, I was playing with fire in a slow burning hell, yet it brought me closer to my faith in ways I had never been before. I became more aware of my nafs, and this led me to ask questions. Did sinning mean you didn't belong within particular lines of religions or communities that you shouldn't simply leave? Or did it mean the sins you faced were your test? Did good things come more easily to those who obeyed or those who failed and then tried again? For God would never give a person a burden that was more than they could bear. What made a good person, a good woman? Within the dark light, I looked for clarity. All of this, you write, 
in all of this, you write, one thing was clear. What women do with their bodies and what feelings they have cannot be imposed on them. Can they be taken, uh, imposed on them, nor can they be taken, not through a look, nor rationale, scientific explanation. Nothing that is done to can tamper with. As a human, her dignity is an innate right, and what she does with her body is for her to define. And I thought, wow, that is a powerful, both it's a powerful faith statement, it's a powerful feminist statement, it's a powerful statement about dignity uh, for women. Uh, it's such an incredibly, incredibly and critically important point you make at that point in the book. Can you say more about what you were experiencing in those years as a young woman coming out of adolescence, a young woman coming of age, and how the pressures that you were under affected your faith, or perhaps how your faith helped you navigate that process? Because one of the things that I found most uh, special about this is that you don't describe your faith as a challenge to this as much as you do something that got you through it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, those were really hard years. <laughs> I bet, like really hard years. Um, yeah. So, um, I think what I struggled with the most with that relationship, and I'll say this actually before I start with getting into that, is that I I was quite young at the time. Like I met mm. Bob. 15 and mm -hmm. 21 and so um you know I that's something it's interesting because like in retrospect and now as I'm talking about that relationship some people are like I've, I've had feedback where they sort of questioned that age gap and you know like sort of why Bob would pursue someone who was so young and like how quickly um I kind of uh, fell into this situation at, at such a young age and, and um, you know, at a time where young girls are exploring their identity or being with friends or pursuing hobbies. And so that's something that uh, I thought about quite a bit as I was writing, but especially after I wrote the book and reflecting on it. And I just wanted to make a note that I think some of that, like the the normalization of that um, had a lot to do with culture as well. Yeah. Very much common in my culture, um, as you could tell from the book, that yeah. for the relationships to happen between, you know, older males and, and younger, younger females. But anyhow, that's just a, a little, little, uh, mm -hmm. that's something that I've been sitting with and processing and, and, and what that means. Um, but anyhow, I, I would still stand by the fact that I did experience that relationship as love. And I think what I struggled with the most about that, uh, there was one, because it was uh, premarital. It was uh, a relationship outside of marriage. Um, and my faith was, it still, it was quite important to me at that time. I, you know, it, that was a message I had received from an early age, you know, not engaging in any kind of relationships, especially, you know, physical, sexual relationships outside of marriage. So that was a very strong message. Um, so that the premarital nature of that relationship, but also just the the inability to like talk about it. And so the secrecy around it was something I very much struggled with because I felt it, it, it clashed against like my sense of being a good person at the time. Um, and then also, and like not being honest, like enough, like with my parents, but rightfully so because I was scared. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, yeah. In addition to that, what I grappled with about that was just also messages around uh, interfaith relationships, and yeah. that was it's such a huge topic that you know even now, like to this day, that many Muslim women are are trying to navigate and, and understand. And at that time, at a such a young age. Yeah. Like it was really hard for me to process all of that. And so, um, you know, one thing that's really interesting about that whole thing is that, you know, as I say in the memoir, there's in terms of who people can marry, you know, they, yeah. and this, of course, I'm, I'm talking about just like the heterosexual. Yes. Right now. Yeah. Um, within that, you know, 
Muslim men allowed to marry people of the book. So like Christian, Jewish, like yeah. monotheistic religions. Whereas um, Muslim women, you know, commonly people like con they they say, you know, they just cannot marry outside of the faith. That's sort of like a, something that's sort of taken um, mm -hmm. with as, as, as normal. And so, um, but I never really understood why. And so when I, at that age, when I tried to kind of dig into that, you know, they, there was these, it was never really clear because, you know, there's all these like passages that were quoted, but none of them directly really stated much that made complete sense to me. Like it wasn't really working with my, my logic, um, but not, and then outside of the, the Quranic um, passages and texts, you know, there was also like these cultural reasons. Um, so for example, these messages I had received about, you know, well, men usually would be the head of the household. So if a Muslim woman marries someone who's non-Muslim, she's more likely to be under his influence and then therefore lose her faith. Or if they have children, the child will probably take the father's identity and not uh, the mother's, even though the mother spends so much time potentially with the child. So these kind of you know assumptions, um, they were sort of the the grounding reasons for why Muslim marriages between Muslim women and non-Muslim men were were discouraged. Um, but they sat on an existing framework of patriarchy of like yeah. you know it, it of assumptions about like power really like male privilege really like the the authority that would come with like a specific gender and yeah. so that like that was troubling for me because I just didn't feel like that was necessarily a complete reflection of reality like mm -hmm. you know I, and so I I grappled with that and I also felt like that that seemed human constructed to me it didn't seem like a divine message it didn't have that that kind of a quality that felt divine to me but the thing about that is that it was complicated because oh. i the thing with islam is that there's a lot of like deep philosophy behind it but there's a component about of the religion that's very much based on uh, social connections and social order and um and uh community and so, like, one cannot be separated out of the community. It's, it's quite collectivist. And so I think, like, on a very, like, practical level, if we were to kind of think about the scholars back in the days, you know, looking at the social conditions of that time and, you know, um, looking at Sharia law and then, you know, creating these fixed um, or, like, uh, you know, guidelines for how to navigate different aspects of of, of society and like living, and um, you know, it like the the component the part of Islam that tries to um, make the religion not just a spiritual sort of um, experience, but rather something that can be practically applied, um, so that people can actually. Um, express virtue in very concrete ways in the communities that they live in and that they serve. Like it, it like it's understandable how um, some of these got like these uh these rules or these like guidelines might have been created at a particular point in history. And of course, like I'm not going to get into that because I'm not an mm -hmm. expert. There's so much nuance and so much compl like complexities related to that. But essentially. The, what wasn't working for me was I felt like the interpretations of that were very much based on like a reality that may be changing in the present moment and in the True. context that I was in. Um, and so the question was like, you know, in order to be a Muslim, like, you know, spiritually, I felt quite connected to some of the really deep messages that were very egalitarian, actually. You know, we talk about the souls, all souls being equal. You know, we talk about this concept of fitra and like also how all souls are, you know, we we assume are born um, good uh, with goodness. And so there's this sort of, yeah, and also, you know, when you're, when you go like day of judgment and you're 
in front of Allah, everybody is um, on the same same sort of uh, like you, you're not you cannot be distinguished by the clothing you wear or the class you're from or the mm -hmm. so anyhow the egalitarianism that comes with some of these profound spiritual messages it seemed to clash very much with um, these sort of uh, rules that that w the intention like whatever the intention may have been at the time, it just didn't feel like it was working with the present. And so I, I grappled with that so much. And the the worst part of it was, it was so hard to have this conversation with anybody. Yeah, I, I, I tried to talk to different imams about this. And I found it so hard to navigate that because, you know, I either got, well, like, just an email with like quotes from di of different passages saying like, we're not, we wouldn't condone this or, um, you know, there's like, or just, just, just like not really paying, really sitting and trying to understand the the perspective of a woman with like lived experience trying to navigate these things. Like, and so I, I, I like couldn't find that support mm. through uh, mosques or um, mm. other religious leaders. And then of course I couldn't really express and talk about that within within the family as well and so it was quite um it was something that i kept inside of me for quite a bit of time and yeah. and sat with um so not to go on and on i just wanted to say that uh i think that this whole ordeal before what happened in bangladesh and then even after i came back um it was really a process of me individuating from these cultural messages um, of me, like trying to understand um, some of the the history behind how some of these um, you know rules were formulated and the social conditions of different time periods and Muslim history, and like really kind of trying to understand all of those things and kind of separate it out from you know, my own lived experience. And I think to me, that was a very important thing to do because I think what often happens is that like we can subscribe to authority quite easily. Um, and especially I find like women um, sometimes might feel like they don't have a right to or ownership to engage in seeking. Um, spiritually seeking answers or uh, learning um, religious knowledge. And for me, it was the turning point was really just taking ownership of that and giving myself permission and saying, yeah, you know, I have, I am going to these people to get answers, but I think it's okay. I think it's okay for me to also try to give some of those answers to myself and, and really thinking about my own centering everything around also my own lived experiences. Um, I think that that's important. And I feel like that's what's missing in a lot of the books I've read. Uh, I don't really, when, when it comes to learning about the religion, I don't hear much about Muslim women's experiences. Right. When I go into these um, mosques or other institutions, I don't see counselors who are. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's part of the reason why now, you know, I'm, like in the field of counseling and I have taken training on Islamic mm -hmm. psychotherapy because I think there's such a strong need for uh, trying to understand the unique experiences of women of faith navigating yeah. their systems. But anyways, not to go on a tangent. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, during that time, that's, that's sort of how I, how I navigated those, those pressures. And, yes. and not only that, um, I think you had said something earlier about um, faith and running through the heart. I can't yeah. quite remember. <laughs> yeah, it's Alexander Stolstitsyn who said that the line that separates good from evil. This is not I'm, I'm paraphrasing the quote, but the line that, separ that separates that which which is good from that which is evil runs through the heart of every man. Yeah, it's it's not out there. It's exactly there. exactly, and so the the islamic the search that i my own personal seeking and searching one like a philosophy and this is actually one of the core philosophies of, of the religion um 
you know, we talk about the heart being the center of mm -hmm. existence functioning actually like with executive functioning i mean it's a very technical term but like yes are like um you know it's it's where everything gets integrated so yeah. you know we have our thoughts we have our emotions we have our behavioral inclinations like our enough like our habits that get formed like our basic uh humanistic like animalistic drives we have like all these different components of the human psyche and experience but everything gets filtered through the heart um it's sort of the center um and i mean and also the soul and so um i think for me and i think different people will have different ways that they can connect to the faith but for me i always ask the question why and i always need to understand why and so grounding um, my faith and like thinking about faith in in um, this psychology of the human psyche has actually been very helpful to me because it took me back to, okay, you know, there's these messages externally that I'm receiving. There's like these um, these like laws and rules that I'm reading about. But at the end of the day, like I need to go back to my heart. There's these mosques that I'm visiting, like, there's these um you know whatever it is that i'm doing i coming back and, and trying to understand all the different parts of me that get activated at different times and developing a self-awareness about what's internal self-awareness and introspection um i think has been one of the most helpful um you know parts of my faith experience and it has helped me gain a lot more ownership sure, um, I bet. yeah and and then also just the emotions you mentioned, you know, in the quote, shame, shame yes. here. And, yeah. you know, like, I think that's the core of, of um, sometimes like when, when you do, when I have tried to have these conversations or when I have like sat with um, thinking about those experiences, forbidden moments, it's really like the shame and the fear um and and kind of allowing myself to to sit with those emotions and try to understand them and understand like where they're coming from like perhaps a part of that is connected to you know the the social conditioning and the social messages but perhaps another part of that is connected to myself as a spiritual being and the lines and boundaries that i may feel that i i am crossing by engaging in certain activities um that like may not feel right to me and like really kind of um, pro pro allowing myself to process some of those bigger, deeper emotions. And I think that's what's, what's missing sometimes in our, in our community, in faith communities is like, like this, this um, we just acknowledgement of emotion and um, really just sitting with it and understanding it. And this is why it was so important for me um, you mentioned earlier how I talk about like Shaitan so easily uh, in the book. It was important for me to, you know, talk about this gray space of not having answers, of sitting with feelings like shame and fear, um, and kind of, um, and, and it's through that experience, that haze and that darkness and that confusion that eventually an answer will emerge, but we need to allow ourselves to do that. What often happens is people get uh, ostracized too early and too uh, unnecessarily when they're just trying to process these um, emotions. Uh, and uh, as, because, you know, it somehow brings up fear um, in another um, person in the faith community for whatever reason. Surely, yeah. We're understandable. Oh, yeah, we're, we're we're almost out of time, but I do want to get to one last um, just quote from the book, and I really enjoyed um, this because it, it talks about how you know those that are on our path, and we talk about this often on the podcast. Those that are on our path um, are are all there, connecting with us in certain ways that we may not even be aware of, um, and and you point to that in the book, and um, the quote is is this that you write. Is it possible that all those who have touched us coexist in our hearts simply because their essence is really a manifestation of the attributes of God? Mm. It, it's what the person gave us, you know, their gift, 
something that we needed to see and experience at a particular point in time and becomes a part of us. When we own that part, we can let go. But with that means we love less. We can still appreciate their gifts from afar with a certain tenderness. Mm. The people I loved, the people for whom I am deeply grateful. And I thought maybe we could just wrap up the last few minutes we have today by just having you say more about the relationships you have now with family and friends and and how, you know, how is that a manifestation of the attributes of God? Yeah. Um, well, it I would say writing this memoir has been, certainly been a journey and, uh, you know, has triggered many different emotions for different people in my family. Yeah. In my circle. Like yeah. <laughs> so even I'd that, say so. It's like, wow, that's is very honest. Yeah. So even that process in itself has been um, like I've had to process a lot. And uh, I think part of what has helped me is understanding like people's limitations um, or capacities at various points and having compassion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, there were so many times along this journey where I felt like I was on this healing journey on my own. Mm. At some points I felt like others had joined me, but then I felt like I, I realized after that maybe not so much mm -hmm. <laughs> I had or, or, or wanted or desired so deeply. And so I, I, it, it was the similar feelings of, you know, um, pain have come up for me multiple times and, you know, I think what has helped is each and every time, like it has actually brought me back to my faith um, in that I, I've had to kind of go back and um, once again, just try to understand that people have different ways that they cope with mm -hmm. the experiences that they have. And um, certainly like in my family, like this was, this was a, a very difficult challenge for me, but it did impact the rest of my family as well. And mm -hmm. so their own reactions to, to the experience. And so um, just kind of like holding space in a way where um, like, I just, I just kind of um, return to like return to the, the what I mentioned at the very beginning of this uh, podcast interview, this, 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 um, this like feeling of ultimately God is the source of love, mm -hmm. and um, in these really difficult moments and of pain, like what I really need to do is go back and um, allow myself to feel loved by God. Mm -hmm. Um, and love God. And yeah. uh, ultimately, that is the most important thing. Um, and so I think that has really grounded me a lot. Um, and that doesn't mean that I cannot appreciate the, the gifts that all these other people in my life do offer, because they do offer different mm -hmm. types of gifts. Mm -hmm. um, and so allowing myself to receive that and to reciprocate that while at the same time know that like different people have different um sort of thresholds of their own pain um and their different ways of uh of like um you know uh, how much they can enter into my experience if right. that makes sense and so yeah it's sort of been like a, a mantra um or a reminder that has has grounded me i will say that um yeah, and I think just continuing to process some of the um, intergenerational uh, traumas, uh, yeah. trying to understand that a little bit more um, has certainly been helpful. Um, when I work with clients, seeing clients experience uh, the impacts of intergenerational trauma in, in different ways as well, mm -hmm. both yeah. from, you know, colonialism, but yeah. also from you know, their own migration histories, uh, and then just being here in Canada and, and, and their identities. And so I think, like, it's, there's so much work left to be done. Mm -hmm. um, I think, ultimately, um, you know, the centering it around 
uh, personal like you connect like the personal your personal connection to God at the end of the day is the most important thing. And even mm -hmm. if you are God, and this is something I had to learn so many times where I felt very disappointed and mm -hmm. angry. And yeah. Just keeping that line of communication open with God, even if I I feel like I'm certain days I hate God, like being able <laughs> yeah. to communication yeah. has been yeah. very helpful. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, we are, yeah. And we are, you know, we echo that and we're glad that, you know, we've had the opportunity to cross paths with you and your life story and your work. Um, because in that way, as you say, we're, 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 you know, we're maybe touching base here for reasons that we don't even uh, imagine right now, but that will make that's manifest. That's the beauty. You know, that's the beauty of it, isn't that's it, Rob? Like... Of it. Yeah, that's the beauty yeah. of it. It's exactly, exactly. Yeah. So we're we're quite thankful that you've given us the time today, mm -hmm. and that you've uh, put out your memoir and your book. And we want to thank you for being on the on the podcast, and wish you all the best with it moving forward. Okay, thanks, Amaya. So yeah, folks, I have to say to you: pick up the Shaitan Bride, and you'll learn all about those five harrowing months that you had hmm. in Bangladesh as a 19 year old, the pressures that were to bear the generational traumas of colonialism and everything that's happened there. Hmm. There's a lot, there's a lot to be said. And I learned a tremendous amount from it and from you. And I'm uh, just proud that you're here, that you're Canadian and that you're so honest with your faith story. So thank you yeah. for spending time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Great. Thanks so much, Samai again. And I uh, really appreciate oh. Um, the time and, and the work you put into this. And this is uh, a transformative memoir in many respects. So we encourage uh, and, people to pick it up. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And as I noted at the beginning of this too, she really takes great pains to want to portray her faith and the faith uh, of Islam as something very positive, which yeah. it really is. And this has been a great gift to us today too. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks guys. Good to get together again. Great to see you again, Ian. And yeah. uh, we want to thank our sponsors just before we make our way out of here one more time to A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family owned and operated. Our thanks to the Diocese of Huron, a community where families and individuals from Windsor to Owen Sound, Grand Bend to Port Rowan come together to worship and to serve and our good friends at Molly Maid. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. I'm Rob Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's. Kevin George, St. Aidan's Church. My name is Ian. Thank you for listening. And remember, Kevin, to always look both ways. It's snowy out there and it's really dangerous. You got to look both ways before you cross the street. That's right. Slippery. Yeah. Slippery. You kaplat. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Our hosts are Kevin George and Rob Henderson. Our producer and composer is myself, Ian, with original artwork done by Elizabeth Dodman. If you have any questions or want to know where to find us, tweet us at Vickers Crossing or find us on Facebook at The Vickers Crossing. If you have any other questions about anything heard on this podcast, leave us a comment or look in the description to find out more. Thanks!